Hello, and welcome to Veterans Remember. Uh, I'm Dick Gooding, your host of Veterans Remember. And uh, uh, as you recall, we meet with many of our veterans here in town to let them share their experiences, both as uh, youths growing up in Hopkinton and then also their experiences uh, when they went into the military service. We've had a number of families here in town. We've been blessed with that over the years. Uh, people like the Bowkers, the Cumlins, the Whalens, and uh, uh, who have served our country uh, wartime and in peacetime. And uh, uh, we have the opportunity today to meet with yet another family from Hopkinton, and that's the Carters. And joining me today are Paul Carter and his daughter Cheryl Becker, uh, both of whom uh, spent time in the service. And Cheryl, as a matter of fact, has just recently retired from active military duty as a lieutenant colonel in the uh, U.S. Army, and we certainly congratulate and thank you for your service. Uh, we will uh, uh, talk with the, the two of them and give them an opportunity to uh, share with you your, their experiences, and I think that you'll enjoy this, uh, this, uh, uh, this experience. Paul, first of all, I'd like to, uh, like to ask you a little bit about uh, uh, how did you get to Hopkin and when did you move to Hopkin and uh, what in the world ever brought you to a town like Hopkinton? The rent was low. The rent was low. <laughs> <laughs> no, when did you, uh, uh, when did you join, uh, when did you come to Hopkin and where did you come from? I came from uh, Natick, Mass. And I moved up here, I think it was 62. Bought a house on Maple Street. It was a good deal at the time, so we jumped in. And what were you doing? Uh, what were you doing at the time? Uh, uh, working as, locally, or as a bricklayer? You're a bricklayer, and were you doing work locally, or yep. were you in, into Boston, or yeah, Boston, everywhere. I see. And and your family. Uh, 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 Cheryl's not your only uh, no, family member. Four other daughters. Four other daughters. All all women. All women. Reminds yeah. me of the Colella family. Had to lay a lot of brick. Reminds, reminds me of the Colella family. You probably know some yep. of the Colellas as yeah. well, all of the girls there, and uh, certainly they've been around for a long time. Well, Paul, when, uh, when did you join the service? 1955. And what, what brought you into the service to begin with? Well, I just couldn't see myself standing on the corner anymore. I had to get out of town. I had to get out of town. <laughs> well, you didn't go far. You came uh -huh. back, right? Well, I just wanted to get out in that ocean and see what was going on. And uh, you, were, uh, you were in the Navy. Right. And uh, how long did you spend in the Navy? Uh, one hitch, four years. Mm -hmm. And uh, what sorts of assignments did you have? I was a coxswain in the Navy. Mm -hmm. Ran a boat. It's a seaman. And, and what, uh, what sorts of uh, assignments did you have? Well, tie up when you're coming in. I was a... Uh, on a gun crew, general quarters, five-inch gun. Uh, you know, generally take care of the ship, stand watches. And you served uh, primarily in the Atlantic when you were on. Yeah, on, uh, was in the Pacific once. And what was the what was the name of the ship that you served on? Uh, USS Kepler. I think we have a picture of that, don't you? Can you yep, reach right that? Here. And I'll hold it up, and maybe you can. Uh, let me make sure I don't put it upside down. And uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about this uh, uh, this ship. Uh, what, what what did it do? Well, <clears throat> when I was on it, it was uh, we started uh, ch uh, in the sub sub chasing submarines. Mm -hmm. that was, we were just breaking in on that when I first got aboard. Before that, it was uh, we our main job was uh, going. Going with the carriers and guarding the carriers, aircraft carriers, and that was both along the U.S. shore and mm -hmm. and out out everywhere. farther everywhere. Yeah. Did uh, uh, at that time I think a lot of people perhaps don't even realize that uh, uh, we did that. Uh, but oh. back in the fifties, it was the heat of the cold, the heat of the Cold War. Yeah, that's I was going to say it was a Cold War. Yeah. What countries? We, nobody's talk, talks much about the Cold War. <laughs> <laughs> what countries? Yeah, what countries were we? Well, all the Mediterranean, Arabia. I see. And uh, South America. And did you ever run into subs that uh, well, caused you a little bit of difficulty? No, never did. Never yeah. did. Mostly uh, just chasing, you know, 
never chased, uh, never caught any bad guys. <laughs> you had a Just playing, playing the games with our own. You had to stand watch off of Lebanon. Yeah. I was over there and uh, when they shut down the Suez Canal, I think it was 58 or 57 in around there. What, what did they shut it down for, Paul? They're having a little beef between Egypt and like they're probably having now. They're they've always had having beefs, a beef over they've there. They've had beefs for thousands yeah, of years, I, I mean. think. Yeah. So they shut it down, so we were getting ready to go through. And uh, I think there was some civilians in Lebanon. They had a little riot there or something. Mm -hmm. So we got we had to go back there and you know stay off uh, offshore. And they landed some Marines there for a week or two. Hmm. And we were there for a couple of weeks, and then we, the canal opened, we went down. <clears throat> and then they stayed six months in the Gulf. In the Gulf? Yeah, you stayed the Gulf. there, uh, what, protecting, yeah. uh, uh, what, U.S. Uh, Navy ships and then U.S. Yeah. regular merchant marine ships as well? Well, we were guarding the... Guarding the uh, Making sure there's no shenanigans going on in the, the canal. I think huh? the Navy's been there since 48 or 47. Yeah. They might still be there, for all I know. I think a lot of people today don't even realize... Uh, Navy's what, always been there. Yeah, what has gone on, what went on during the Cold War time. Mm -hmm. I know when I was in junior high school, which would have been, I guess, in the 50s, mm -hmm. late 50s, uh, there used to be a ground observer corps, uh, and they were right up by uh, behind Irvine's garage. They had a little uh, shack where we looked up and watched for airplanes and then called in every time we saw an airplane go over. No. We'd have to call it in as a ground observer corps uh, for fear of uh, Russians coming over and dropping yeah. bombs or something at, mm -hmm. at that time. But that's similar. Well, Cheryl, uh, you, you've uh, just finished up uh, a long career in the service. Uh, tell us a little bit about why you got into the service to begin with and when. Well, it, high school, so it was either um, college or the Army because I wanted to go to um, dental hygiene school. Well, first I went to talk to the Navy, but I still had the braces on my teeth, and they sat me in the corner with a book. So, little braces one. on your teeth, and they sat you in the corner. Maybe, maybe you can explain to the uh, to the audience what what the, the you know what that really meant. Well, the services won't take anyone with braces because they don't um, they don't take responsibility for the treatment. And I still had them on, and as I had them on all through high school. So, anyway, um, that's why I want to be a, a dental hygienist. So. It was either go to the school or go into the service. So um, after the Navy didn't pay attention, the Army recruiter came to school, and he also brought a female soldier with her hair down, <laughs> <laughs> which I still have today. And I talked with her a long, long time in the library. And um, he worked with me. And you know he wasn't going to get over on me because I got my father. My cousin was a CB in Nam. My other, his brother was a Marine in Okinawa, because during Vietnam they didn't let brothers go to the same theater. Right. And my father wasn't going to let him, you know, give me anything that I didn't, you know, want. So when my grandfather was a Marine, so um, that recruiter got, earned his money getting me. So <laughs> I finally, it took probably a year. And I had to wait till after graduation, so I worked for the phone company like a week after graduation until I got my braces off. I got the school, and I went off to basic training in May of '75. Um, what did Dad think of uh, of his daughter going off to uh, the military at such a young age? She must have been what 17, 18 years of oh, age. Oh no, females had to be eighteen. Oh, had I, to be eighteen. Yeah, I, see. I was eighteen. Almost nineteen. I was eighteen that August. And I and, left and in was the Dad following May, yeah. Was he encouraging you, or what did he think Oh, he it? was. My mother wasn't, but, <laughs> you know, it was the 70s. Yeah. It wasn't a good time to, for a female to go, but a lot of us were. So where did you do your basic? I was a WAC, mm -hmm. so the Women's Army Corps at Fort McClellan, Alabama. And then from there, um, I went to dental assistant school. You have to go 
through assistant school at Fort uh, Sam Houston, Texas. And then um, I went to work at Fort Gordon, Georgia in the dental clinic. Went back to Fort Gordon for dental hygiene school. Went back to Fort Gordon, worked as a dental hygienist. Then I um, went back to, uh, oh, while I, then I earned um, my expert field medical badge where you go through loading helicopters. You know, we weren't at war or anything, so we were kind of just working in the dental clinic. Sure. So um, the operations officers set up a training course so we could go to the field and learn how to set IVs and um, do all the field medical things. Sure. So that's how I earned uh, the field, expert field medical badge. And I just came out of doing a 12-mile road march with all the rock and pack and all that on and took off my boots and lost all my toenails and everything. Lost all your toenails? <laughs> and my heels oh, were all dear. blistered. And I, was, I couldn't even go to the party we were having when we, I was on a plane to Fort Sam again to go to the NCO Academy. And I was prom um, I got promoted out of the dental hy um, hygiene school as an honor graduate, and then I got awarded my my expert field medical badge down at that school. Wow. Had you ever thought of uh, becoming a dentist? Uh, I did, but I you know I wasn't um, no. No. I, I did for a while, but I'll tell you um, when I was ready to reenlist. I wanted, I couldn't get promoted as, it, it was peacetime, I couldn't get promoted, and the phone company, I went back to talk to the phone company, and they had a career path for me, and I could stay in the reserves, and then the Army didn't really have anything to offer me right. at the time, and my boss, they were, they were, um, I was already in the admin field, Sure. and I was setting up, we separated medical and dental company, and so I was set up the orderly room for the dental company, and I was like the personnel NCO company clerk, mm -hmm. and doing everybody's leaves and awards and decorations and evaluations and cleaning teeth part time. So I learned that when you get to the top of anything, you end up in the administrative field. <laughs> so my degree is in business, and my master's is in human resources. Now, were you, were you able to uh, earn your degrees while you were in the service or uh, after you had gotten? Well, when I, when I finished my enlistment as a um, um, enlist, enlisted soldier, right. I was in the reserves and did that. I worked at was the phone. Was that folk. local as well? Yes. Did you, so you came back to Hopkinton yeah. each time? Uh, yeah, I uh, came uh, back and I worked at the phone company. I went to Northeastern at night. My undergrads at, from Northeastern. And um, I used my GI Bill. You paid for everything. Skip list point. Oh, yes. It, it paid for everything, the GI Bill, didn't it? Um, not everything. No? I, no. When I, uh, I went to uh, Northeastern under the GI Bill as I was leaving the service, actually mm -hmm. while I was still in, in the uh, early 70s, and uh, went to Northeastern Night School for my graduate degree. And uh, it covered everything. While you're still in. While I was still in. Yeah. yeah. When you, it's, it didn't cover books, it didn't cover certain things, but while I was in, when I came back from one school and they had just opened up West Point to females, my boss wanted me to There were a lot of us who uh, weren't sure that was a good thing. Well, For the <clears throat> folks in the audience, I went to West Point back in the 60s before women were in. We were, I was uh, offered a chance to go to the prep school. Right. and be in the first class. Of, and I called my father, and my father said, go for it, kid. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, Dad, I don't know if I want to be in that first class of women, and I don't know if I want to do basic <laughs> training and college at the same time. Yeah. But I went to OCS at Fort Benning, officers candidate at Fort Benning later on, so it all worked out. Yeah. Why did you, uh, uh, that must have been a, a real decision to make to go into the officer corps. Uh, well, I always knew I was going to because um, I thought I could make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I, w I knew I was going to get a degree one day. And um, I kept saying, you know, I could do what these people are doing. <laughs> and, um, well, people that know me, I, I'm a, I, have, I was always a leader in school. So 
and I continued in leader, leadership Fort Benning, Fort Benning must have been a, a fun experience and a great place to go to. to oh uh, yeah, we started 140 OTC. people, right. 10 women, and um, we graduated 70, five women, and um, I was one of the DMGs, distinguished military graduates. So. Well, that's was, um, that's, uh, that's fantastic. Now, uh, your husband, as I understand it, also. Uh, Retired as a full colonel in the in the service recently. Right. When do, where along the way did you meet him? And uh, that must be an interesting story about how your careers paralleled each other. Yeah, we met locking up a reserve center, and um, we I had no interest at the time, but <laughs> <laughs> my mother liked him, and um, actually, yeah, we're we're partners. And, and was the, the service able to uh, accommodate uh, a married couple in the, in, in the service as far as assignments so that you didn't wind up being sent to one coast and your husband to the other? Well, all but when um, we, were, we had just moved to St. Louis and um, my son was five and um, I get the call that um, I'm going to winter in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> so. I went to Desert Storm. He got to stay home in the, with my son, with our son. Wow! And, mm -hmm. and you, you, was Desert Storm a real experience for you? Can you tell oh. us? A, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, that was quite an experience because um, I was mobilized as a reservist and as a medical filler, and it's I was I'm a medical human resources officer, which is a I can do all the emergency medical, but I, and I'm only assigned to medical units. So I take care of the doctors and um, the nurses and all the AMET, the medical people and um, medical department. So in the hospital, we have, uh, like I would be, I'm the hospital adjutant, you know. Sure. You understand. Thanks. And when we went, I had all the Purple Hearts with me that we would give out. I mean, we thought we were going to a very bad war. Sure. That was supposed to be. Exactly. Fortunately, it didn't. And uh, so I had a lot of doctors that weren't too busy, so we put them to work at um, one of the local hospitals. But it was um, a person, for personnel officer, I had active component, I had reservists, I had National Guard, I had... Um, um, the inactive reservists, you know, the ones that are just sitting on, as a number. Sure. And um, I had every component there is in in the hospital hmm. to make it up. Now, when so, you when you were in, uh, assigned in Desert Storm, where were you physically located? Were you in in Iraq or were you in Kuwait? Or? No, we were in Saudi Arabia and Riyadh. In Riyadh. Yeah. So we oh. were getting scudded. And that was that, uh, you know, for how, how far away from that Iraq is it is Riyadh? Oh, that's that's quite a ways. Yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, there's still stuff happening mm -hmm. uh, in Riyadh that mm -hmm. you wish weren't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, every long, night we get the um, alarms. Yeah. How and then we sent in, How long were you oh. in uh, Saudi Arabia? I was in theater for the ground war, mm -hmm. or for the air war, just before the air war started and the ground war. So the 13th of January through the 8th of April. Through the 8th of April? Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, over. was that the, length, the full length of the assignment uh, overseas? Mm -hmm. yeah. and as soon as the war was over, then they started calling all the reservists home. And as soon as I got home, you know, they, they asked us to go march in the parade. And I said, I can't do that. I just got home to my son. So, <laughs> and then um, I came up to visit. And that's when um, Danny Colella, you know, rest in peace. Sure. He um, arranged for a, myself and three other gentlemen. Um, Tommy, uh, Tommy McLeod was one Tom, of them. Tommy McLeod was one of them. Sure. And we got flags and plaques from the town of Hopkinton. That was um, special. I still have those. Hop Hopkinton has always been uh, very proud of its uh, of its veterans and proud of the people who serve and 
uh, it's been it's something that keeps me involved with the community, even though currently I'm not living in Hopkins, uh, you know, at the time. But uh, uh, it's always been, I think, very important to the town, and I, I certainly hope, and, yeah. and certainly a, a big motivation behind uh, Veterans Remember, yeah. and uh, uh, why Hank Alessio, uh, who's in the audience today. Uh, uh, I think has been a strong motivator from uh, from meeting and talking with veterans, and we certainly uh, enjoy this opportunity. And Dad m used to march in the parades for me. Hmm. <laughs> well, we, we we still march in parades. Sometimes we take buses. Sometimes we take jeeps. But uh, you're welcome to join us in any of the uh, parades at, uh, during the festivities. I've she, been talking to Hank on the emails for a couple of years. Yeah, well, that's so. Uh, I finally got to meet him. Yeah. So what do you think of your daughter's career, uh, Paul? <clears throat> Very. I'm sure it's a source of a lot of pride for you, isn't it? Well, we we uh, we certainly uh, we we know how proud uh, your dad is of, of your service and uh, uh, you know, you you were nice enough to bring this this very uh, well done uh, piece, which has uh, uh, I guess it really goes through your entire service. Yeah. Uh, we'll flash it up here for the audience to take a look at, and maybe you could sort of comment a little bit, Cheryl, on uh, yeah. on what 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 some of these mean, if, if well, you if you'd like to. This is my um, combat patch. Okay. So you know that's uh, Third Army. So that's Patton's Third Army. That's right. Yeah. And there are a number of Hopkintonians who were in Patton's Third Army mm -hmm. over in uh, Europe. And then on the upper, um, the left side is my recruiter. I was a recruiter, and um, you know, there's not too many officers that get a, get a recruiter badge. Now there are, but um, so um, I'm kind of proud of that, even though I was recruiting doctors. <laughs> but um, I got uh, a lot of um, NCOs, their gold rings and medallions. And um, this is from Saudi Arabia for the liberation of Kuwait. That's all gold. It's kind of um, neat. And these are all my ranks from a private to a staff sergeant. So I was a Sergeant Carter. <laughs> they used to kid me about that. I'm <laughs> sure they did. And, um, <laughs> There's the expert field medical badge that I told you about. It it's got a stretcher with the, um, yeah, that's like you learn how to load the helicopters and uh, do CPR and, you know, all evacuate patients. Sure. And um, so uh, even though I'm a medical service corps and human resources, I can still um, do the emergency first aid and help, because we all have to be able to help in the hospital. Sure. And, um, this is from Southwest Asia, the Global War on Terrorism. I was at Walter Reed when um, the Pentagon was hit. And then I finished up my career as you know, the second lieutenant. So it was very hard to go from being a sergeant to a, a butta bar, That's a right. second lieutenant. <laughs> and then you're walking around with a butta bar, and nobody knows that you have a, a sergeant. So I always tell everybody, hey, I got staff sergeant stripes under this oak leaf, <laughs> you know, or whatever rank I was wearing because, sure. you know, don't try to pull anything over on me. Yeah. And um, you know, meritorious service medal is the highest. Sure. And then um, lieutenant well, it's colonel. A, it's certainly a, a, a nice little plaque of uh, uh, commemoration of your service. and. Uh, uh, it certainly is uh, something to be proud of. Okay. What do you tell? Tell us what you're doing uh, in retirement, or how long have you been retired, and what well, are you doing in retirement? Well, right now I'm taking it easy and traveling. I just came back from the Panama Canal, and um, oh, well, Dad by the was, way, wasn't Dad in the Panama Canal? Yeah. yeah. You, have, you have an interesting story about that. Tell us about that, Paul. <laughs> What, swimming in Gatun Lake? Yeah. <laughs> I was telling her that, and uh, she said, you wouldn't want to swim in it now. <laughs> this is what, the, there's like halfway through the canal. Yeah, is a, a freshwater a big, lake. A big freshwater lake. It's on the Atlantic. 
closer to the Atlantic, mm -hmm. and uh, you were swimming in there. Yeah. And but we had guards. With guns. Had guards. And there's we crocodiles and snakes and. Boy, the things you do when you're a young man. You're young you and dumb, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's what he told me. I'm taking pictures. I'm like, are you kidding? He swam here? Yeah, he sent a postcard from there. And I, he was in Cuba when I was born. He was in Scotland when the sister next to me, Paula, was born. Wow. And, and then, oh, I know, then um, Lisa, uh, our middle sister, she was, she was hit, hit and killed by a school bus. And I, when we saw Jerry Bowker today, he, he's the one that came to, from the hospital to tell sure. all of us. And he said that was the saddest day of his life. Uh, he well, remembered that today. Well, Jerry certainly... Uh, At the breakfast. Certainly was uh, an active participant in, uh, in Veterans Remember and mm -hmm. uh, was one of our first, uh, first members who joined us. Well, listen, uh, uh, we thank you very much. And uh, on behalf of Veterans Remember, and uh, we, we welcome the Carter family, and we're glad that you had the opportunity to spend some time with the audience today. Uh, Veterans Remember, uh, again, uh, to let everyone know, is, a, uh, is an opportunity for the Hopkins and veterans to share with us their experiences, some of the things that they've done uh, while they were in the service, and then certainly uh, uh, how that links into their life in, in Hopkinton. And I want to thank you very much for joining us today, Paul Carter and his daughter, uh, Cheryl Becker, uh, recently retired Lieutenant Colonel from the U.S. Army. Thank you, folks, and have a good day.